In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, unto the age of all ages, Amen. <clears throat> we continue on in our dogmatic uh, theology course, and we continue with the Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian theology. Uh, just, sorry, I have to take this call. Okay, so today we move to speak about more about the Holy Spirit. Um, we've already th talked about the Holy Spirit a little bit, so today we're continuing on. Uh, we're going to look into the writings of the Church Fathers about the Holy Spirit, and then the titles of the Holy Spirit, the analogies used to defend the Holy Spirit, and then we're going to take something very specific from um, uh, the writings of St. Cyril, and how he spoke about the Holy Spirit, and he put the Holy Spirit, he spoke about six aspects of the Holy Spirit that I think are very critical and very important, and then consequences uh, that, that have come maybe out of uh, you know, the, the issues that were debated or the heresies that came. So we have someone like St. Dinimus the Blind. You probably all know that he, is, he was one of the deans of the school of Alexandria. And he wrote on the Holy Spirit, and he wrote that before 381. There's also St. Athanasius. He has specific, the le specifically the letters to Serapion on the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I have them here for you is that you can consider actually looking them up. They're available. You can download them. And if you need a PDF form, a PDF uh, a copy of it. I can send you a PDF coffee, copy, and you can, maybe I need coffee, and, um, and you can actually um, uh, read the letter of St. Athanasius to Serapion. It's so beautiful. It is rich. It's a very rich letter. Um, um, also reading to someone like St. Didymus the Blind. Uh, maybe you have never read to St. Didymus the Blind. This would be a nice... Uh, you know, oration on the Holy Spirit. Also, St. Basil the Great, lots of writings on the Holy Spirit. So when you come to the Cappadocian Father, St. Basil, uh, uh, St. Gregory, Nazianzus, St. Gregory of Nyssa, you find their stuff has been preserved, like it's, it's there, you can actually access it. So you access stuff like uh, social justice. St. Basil wrote on social justice. Very hot topic, you know, in, 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 in our time now. St. Basil wrote an amazing uh, or, uh, you know, uh, discourse on social justice. St. Gregory the Theologian, who is St. Gregory of Nazianzus, one and the same, his fifth theological oration, Mark number, 20, uh, number 31, uh, also, and you have a copy of this. I've sent you copies of this one. And St. Cyril of Alexandria, the seventh dialogue on the Trinity. You actually can find St. Cyril of Alexandria, the seventh dialogue, uh, translated into Arabic. It actually was found first in English. It did not exist in Arabic. But thanks to uh, Dr. Joseph Feltas, I think, and, and the group of people who work with him, he, they actually translated it. It's Muhawar Hawla Salus, Seba Hawar. A seventh dialogue, very nice, and you can actually uh, get the book from from the uh, the bookstore here. The letter. Uh, so let's look, for example, Saint Alexander on the Holy Spirit. This is a letter to Alexander of Byzantine. The sacred scriptures, and I read here, teach us this pious teaching about the Father and the Son. Yeah, so they can speak about the Father and the Son. In addition, they teach us, and we confess that there is one Holy Spirit who inspired the saints of the Old Testament and the holy teachers of the New Testaments. So who's behind the Testaments, the, the New and the Old? It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one who inspired the writers, whether it be prophets in the Old Testament or the disciples or the apostles in, this, in the New Testament. We confess the one and only apostolic Catholic Church, which does not decay but lasts forever. 
even if the whole world went to war against it, it would still be victorious over all of the wicked attacks of the het heterodox. So the word heterodox is the opposite of orthodox. Orthodox means straight. Heterodox means what is not orthodox, what is not straight. So if you hear the word. Um, our master prepared us for this with his words, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So obviously he's alluding here to people who speak about the Holy Spirit in a, in a wrong way or in, in, in an unorthodox and heterodox way. St. Didymus, he said, the Holy Spirit is inseparable from Christ. Sinning against the Spirit is sinning against the Holy One of Israel. So therefore, he says, the Holy Spirit is God. Because you cannot sin against the Holy Spirit and say that this is a sin against God unless the Holy Spirit is God himself. And this is what St. Didymus is saying. Uh, unified work with the Father and the Son. So he speaks about how there is unity in the work between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what does he write? He says, the Holy Spirit will not speak without me or without my approval and that of my Father because he is inseparable from will and from, uh, from the Father's since he is not from himself but from the Father and from me for the fact that he subsists and speaks is given to him by the Father and me. So he's, he's, he's paraphrasing the words of Christ and showing that if the Holy Spirit was not God, then how can Christ say this about him? He also says, he differentiates in his writing, writing be, between begotten and proceeding. And, uh, and he says there is a distinction. They're not the same. For all begetting and proceeding are realized by beings that are equal and like each other. So if we say something proceeds from the Father, then we are talking about equality. If we say something is begotten, it's also equality. But in the most distinctive way, generation and procession, generation is the begetting. And, and procession, that is for the Holy Spirit. The ge generation and procession from the one Father take place according to the unity of his divinity. So when the Son is begotten of the Father, he is not separate from the Father like a mother and a child. The child is begotten of the mother and they're separate. But in, in the Holy Trinity, the begetting and the proceeding never, is never detached. So it's like the, the procession of the light from the Son. When the light comes here, it doesn't quit the sun. It doesn't leave the sun. It's still in unity with the sun. So this is what St. Didymus here is saying. St. Athanasius on the Holy Spirit, he speaks of th something called, or a group called the Tropesi. Um, this is a group that emerged in Egypt. And it was just before 360. They believe that the Holy Spirit is a creature not God. They believe he's a creature brought into existence out of nothingness. So yes, he's out of nothingness, but he's a creature brought by God. And the word tropos, in, this is a Greek word, it means figure, figurative interpretation of scripture. When you speak of the tropotic meaning of the scripture, figurative interpretation. So Holy Spirit as angel, superior to the ministering spirits. So the tropesi, they actually said, uh, looking at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, they say there are ministering spirits. Those are the angels, but the Holy Spirit is a higher spirit. But not, not exactly like the angel, but similar to the angels. Holy Spirit as angel superior, that's what they said. Probably unrelated to the Macedonians and Pneumatomachians. Pneumatomachians are the fighters against the Holy Spirit. So they're also against the Holy Spirit, but they're differing than the tropesi. And they divided the scripture in Old Testament and New Testaments, um, uh, like the, you know some of the earlier heresies that separated the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. How do we know about the tropesi? Well, St. Athanasius speaks about them in his letter to Serapion, um, um, as, as I indicated here. The Spirit of the Lord. St. Athanasius says in Isaiah, it says the Spirit of the Lord. And he says it means that he is the Spirit of the Godhead and proves that the Spirit of God is neither an angel nor creature but belongs to the Godhead. If he belongs to the Godhead 
That means he is God. There's unity with the Godhead. In Romans chapter 8, he uses that in John 17. He says, if the Spirit is in us, then the Son is in us, and thus the Father. So all three must be one God. Son glorifies the Father, and the Spirit glorifies the Son. The Son declares that he receives from the Father, and the Spirit takes from what belongs to the Son and declares to his disciples. The Father, the Son receives from the Father, the Spirit receives or takes from the Son and gives us. This is not a cascade. This is not one higher than the other, but it shows the unity between them because otherwise, how can they take from each other unless they're actually one? not divided into three separate. St. Athanasius also says, if in regard to order, taxis, and nature, physis, the spirit bears the same relation to the son as the son to the father, will not he who calls the spirit a creature necessarily hold the same to be true also of the son? So St. Athanasius is saying, if some people are saying that the Holy Spirit um, is a creature, Shouldn't they also say that the Son is a creature? So, for if the Spirit is a creature of the Son, it will be consistent for them to say also that the Son or the Logos, the Word, is a creature of the Father. But they don't say that. So, again, these are all discourses and arguments. So, he takes from what they say and say, hold on. How come you say the Son is equal to the Father, but you don't say the same about the Holy Spirit when it is written that the Son takes from the Father and it's written... And you say, because it's, uh, the Holy Spirit takes from the Son, then the Holy Spirit is less. If you say the Holy Spirit is less because of this verse, then you should also say that the Son is less because of this verse. So he's using their arguments against them. He is showing them the fallacy in their arguments. But if there is such coordination and unity within the Holy Trinity, who can separate either the Son from the Father or the Spirit from the Son or from the Father himself? And the answer is no one. St. Didymus, he argued there is a correlation between the operation of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and their usiyya. So the fact that they have, they are one in essence, that correlates what they do. So let me ask you this. If one of your youth asks, so of the Trinity, who created the world? What, what would you say? Hmm? The Son. What's that? Yeah, so we have to say this. It is God, the Holy Trinity, who created the world through his Son. We cannot say, so who died on the cross? The Son. See, this is, we cannot say the Father died on the cross. But who died on the cross was the incarnate Logos. But who was involved in the sacrifice? The Holy Trinity. It's not as some people claim the Father sacrificed His Son. No, the Holy Trinity, the, the Holy Trinity was completely involved in our plan of salvation. The fact that the Logos incarnate is the one who died on the cross doesn't mean that there is a division between the Father who put Him on the cross and the Holy Spirit who is not existent. In, no, no, no. They're all involved, even in the creation. They're all involved. But the distinction is given to the Son. In Him, everything was made. And nothing that was made, out, that was made outside of Him. Everything is made. He is our existence in that sense. We say, who came on the, holy, who, who came on the disciples on the day of Pentecost? And we're about to celebrate the Pentecost. Yeah, we say, God dwelled in the disciples through the Holy Spirit. Okay? But that's what St. Didymus earlier said. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have the Son. And when uh, 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 a, a week ago, I think, uh, uh, we read the gospel when St. Philip uh, asked the Lord Jesus, said, show us the Father and it's, and it's enough for us. He said to him, whoever has seen me has seen the Father, even though he is the Son incarnate. But if you were to, because of the unity that exists, if you were to see the, 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 the Christ, you also see the Father. <clears throat> you cannot find the difference of nature 
between the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, on the basis of the diversity of their operation. They have different operations, but that does not create a difference in nature. Okay? Attacked as being inconsistent, um, St. Athanasius continued his arguments from whatever St. Didymus uh, was arguing, still required a full-scale doctrine of the Holy Trinity in unity and diversity, and that's where the Cappadocian Fathers. So if you were asked on a theology exam, huh, who do we owe a full expression about the Holy Trinity, and specifically the Holy Spirit, you answer, Cappadocian Fathers. Who are the Cappadocian Fathers? Fedi, Uminteni. Who are the Cappadocian Fathers? St. Basil? St. Gregory of Nazianzus, who is also known as St. Gregory the Theologian, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. And you notice St. Gregory of Nyssa, he's, he's an amazing saint, but we don't mention his name in the absolution of the servants. And we don't mention his name in the commemoration of the saints. We say St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Gregory the Wonder Worker. Where's St. Gregory of Nyssa? St. Gregory of Nyssa, he had some mistakes. Some. Not, 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 not big deals, but some. One of which is that um, the son dying on the cross was paying the debt owed to Satan. Similar to Origen. Remember, I told you, when you get stuck... On something wrong, say origin. But origin is an amazing, amazing, amazing person. Yeah. But he did have a series of issues in his discourses. So that's why we don't mention St. Gregory of Nice. But we consider him to be a saintly person, saintly man. One cannot see the Father without the Spirit. It is the unique function of the Spirit. You cannot get to know God without the Holy Spirit. So this is essential. Because no matter what you try and do to discover God or to, to, to find God, you will not be able to do it without the help and the grace of the Holy Spirit who is in you and in me. There is a real functionality of the Holy Spirit to enlighten us to see God. That's why when we say we pray the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds, to see God, to, be, to get God, a revelation of God it cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. As it is written, God has revealed them to us through the Spirit. It is impossible to maintain a life of holiness without the Holy Spirit. That's what St. Basil the Great said. St. Gregory of Nyssa said, So with regard to the Spirit, if one calls him divine, one speaks the truth. So again, very clear that the Holy Spirit is God. St. Basil, what is his contribution? He laid the foundation for the Synod of Constantinople in 381, and he approached his approach of theology, he combined philosophy, wisdom, and worship. And he said that the sources of theology are scripture, patristics, and liturgy. Remember, this is, these are our sources. When you're asked, what are the sources of our faith? We always say three. The scriptures, we the, say the patristics, or the church fathers, and their councils, and the liturgy. Liturgy does not mean Eucharist. It is that plus all liturgies in the church, including the liturgy of baptism, the liturgy, all the lists of liturgies that you can see in a Coptic reader. We don't change. Sometimes we say, oh, anymore. Maybe, but we cannot just change. Uh, and and, and uh, Sarah used to uh, refer or recall or address her husband uh, Abraham and say to him, "My Lord." Some people say this is yeah, this is uh, yeah, it's it's not appropriate. It's not appropriate through the lens of feminism. Okay, you have to understand where this inappropriateness comes from, or it is not appropriate in contrast with patriarchy, which are both. Femin extreme feminism, feminism and patriarchism, both are not good, both are not Christian. But when we listen to it in terms of the narrative of Christ and the church, there's a big difference. Same thing with the baptism. Even if certain things can be changed, no problem. Uh, but we cannot say, oh, let's just remove that. 
And unfortunately, some people have individually done that. I, I'm, not, I'm not for it. You hear me in any, lit, in any um, uh, wedding, if I have to pray this, I say it very slowly, and I say it, and call him my Lord. Yeah. And I am not ashamed of it, and I don't hide it. Because if you understand Christianity properly, you understand that there is no um, oppression of women in marriage. This is a cultural piece, it's not a Christian piece. And one of the things that we have to notice during, during the wedding ceremony is both of them, you notice we put their heads down in front of each other. And this specifically, we have to teach this, we have to talk about this, because both of them must submit to one another. And you notice they get tired a little bit, they put their heads up, and one of the abunas would go and bring their heads back together again. Right? One of the things that could change, um, just on this note, is... You know how we read the letter of St. Paul from Ephesians chapter 5? We need just to go one verse up. Because we begin with, uh, wife, submit your husband. The one verse above it is, submit to one another. So maybe this could be something that we can change. The Holy Synod can change that. So not each one of us kid on our own. Uh, so the sources of theology, like I said, liturgy is very important. Shortcomings. Uh, of St. Basil does not clearly state that the Holy Spirit is God. It's almost like, say it. Does not use the, the term homoousius. What's homoousius? Homo? One. Ousius, ousia. About one in essence or one in nature. The Oration 31, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, Sermon 380, say, Some say Holy Spirit is a force. Energia comes the word energy. This comes from the Greek origin, energia. Or creature. He says that. He says some people say that. Some decline to commit to any opinion. So some of, he's, who's he talking about? Who's some? The church fathers. In their orations. Then he says, if the one was from the beginning, then the three were so too. St. Gregory of Nazianzus is the one who clearly said the Holy Spirit is God. Everybody else was like, yes, he is, but no one else said it. We believe he's one with the Father and the, and the, and the Son, but no one really used the expression. Who put the expression out there? Gregory of Nazianzus. You can read the oration number five on your own. St. Cyril of Alexandria. Dialogues on the Trinity, especially Dialogue 7. So when you get the book, it's like Dialogue 1. You read it, Dialogue 2, and so on, and 7. And also, you, in re reading his commentary on St. John, St. Athanasius, St. Didymus, Origen, Cappadocians, you see in St. Cyril's writing the smell, you smell the aroma of the writings of those who came before him. There are people who did their doctorate degree and PhD on the impact of St. Athanasius on St. Cyril, the impact of St. Didymus on St. Cyril, the impact of Origen on St. Cyril, of the Cappadocians on St. Cyril. St. Cyril is one of those saints in our church who is amazing because he combines and, 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 and respects the writings of all those who were before him and he brings it and expresses it in a very open and beautiful way. That's why in the entire Christian world, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Eastern or Oriental, St. Cyril is the doctor of theology that is he's, he's common amongst all the churches, which is a very good thing because if we have ecumenical dialogue, we can come to St. Cyril and we find that we're in agreement when we speak of St. Cyril. He is the point of connection. He speaks about six aspects of his theology. Uh, Father Brian Daly has a very, very interesting, beautiful article called The Fullness of the Saving God, Cyril of Alexandria on the Holy Spirit. So he says that this, the, the, St. Cyril's pneumatology has six aspects. The Holy Spirit is not just an instrument, but he is proper to the Father. 
proper. What does proper mean? Or say, can you give me your proper name? What does it mean? Versus nickname. It means proper names means your actual name. Your actual name. So he's not an instrument, but he is proper to the Father. He is actually in essence with the Father. Truthfully, completely. Pro he is, he, the Spirit is not foreign to the Father. He is proper to the Father. And from there comes the word property. It's mine. Holy Spirit is most present and active in creation. How do we know this? First few verses, the first verses in Genesis says what? And the Spirit was hovering on the water. Holy Spirit is so close to us, so immediate in experience, yet less personal in our expression. Which means sometimes we turn to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, please help me, my Lord, I love you. But when we speak to the Holy Spirit, we don't say that. We don't say, oh, Holy Spirit, it sounds odd. Oh, Holy Spirit, help us. Oh, Holy Spirit, be with me today. But we can, actually. But when, when sincere was asked, why is it that we feel so close to Jesus, but we don't feel that we can use those terms with the Holy Spirit? He said, because the Holy Spirit is so close to us that we can sometimes, often we cannot make that distinction. He is so within us that we cannot do it. But, of course, the fathers say, oh, Holy Spirit, uh, you know, when we say um, the litanies of the third hour, ayyuha al malik is samai uh, who are we talking to? Who is the Malik Samai? Samai? Uh, it's the Holy Spirit. You, you know the litany, right? Uh, remind me how it starts. Um, oh, um, I know it in Arabic. I'm trying to think it in English. Oh, Holy, oh, you are Malik Samai. Okay, oh, Heavenly King. The Comforter. Thank you, Fed. The, the heavenly thing, the comfort. Who are we talking about? We're not talking about the Father. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. And we find this actually in the writings of St. Bulis al Bushi. And I read this to you before, uh, the, or the, his writing on the Holy Spirit. He actually uses that litany that we have. He is actually, he writes that litany. So he is so close and immediate in experience, yet less personal in our expression. It's like, for example, do you feel your spirit? No. Why? Because it's so close to the core of you. That's what Sincere is saying. Not subordinate. So he is not subservient or less than the Father and the Son. The fifth aspect is the Trinity in Scripture. The baptism of Jesus Christ. It says something happened in the baptism of Jesus Christ that Sincere said, hold on, we have to speak about it. What happened? He said Jesus Christ came to the River Jordan and St. John did not want to baptize him. But he said to him, you must to, in order to fulfill all righteousness. Okay, what righteousness? Isn't Jesus righteous? So he said, yes. Has the Holy Spirit that came and, in the form of a dove and rested on Jesus was not in unity with Jesus and had to come on him as a separate being? He said, no. Then why did he come? To announce what? That was announced through the words of, of, of the Father when he said, this is my beloved Son. Why the Holy Spirit comes and dwells on the Son when he has never separated from the Logos? This is the piece. It's announced something, but what? So St. Cyril, this is according to St. Cyril, he said, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them united to him through the Holy Spirit. When Adam and Eve sinned and separated from God, how did they separate? They lost the connection with the Holy Spirit. What did Christ come to do? He came to revert back that which Adam ruined. So when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus Christ, he came on, uh, on God in human form. So he rested on humanity again. Therefore, through what Christ has done, 
The Holy Spirit can come in Pentecost, but he cannot come before Christ finishes his work. So then Cyril said, the baptism of Jesus was not for Jesus, but was for the humanity that Jesus took to himself. And the Holy Spirit came on that humanity anew, one, one, once again. And then he said, he speaks about another part. Jesus, he breathed in the face of his holy disciple and said, receive the Holy Spirit, whoever sins your... What is this breath? St. Cyril says, when God created Adam and Eve, when God created Adam, he breathed. And St. Cyril said, in that breath, he gave him rational soul and the Holy Spirit. St. Cyril is the only church father who highlighted this part. So he said, what Christ did in John 20... He was bringing back the breath of the Spirit back to the disciples. And, and, and in those two, we were able to receive this unity again uh, to, with the Father in Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And St. Cyril uh, wrote a lot about the letters of St. Paul, where St. Paul says, in Christ, in Christ. Go and read the letters of St. Paul again and highlight any time St. Paul says, in Christ. Huh? You'll find most of his letters has in Christ, in Christ, and several of those. St. Cyril has um, taken that and highlighted it. In Christ through the Holy Spirit. And then he said, the life of sanctification can only happen by the Holy Spirit. So what is the operation? What is the function of the Holy Spirit? Is to sanctify us. Sanctify us means what? What does to sanctify? I'm one of the youth in your class, and I ask you, what does it mean to be sanctified? What, does, what do you mean the Holy Spirit sanctifies us? What's that, Random? Makes us holy. What does that mean? I don't know what holy means. makes us suitable for God to settle within us. What does suitable mean? is the essence of our orthodoxy. So far we answered in a semi-orthodox way. It's orthodox, but semi. What does it mean to sanctify us? When Jesus said, I sanctify myself for their sake, what does it mean? Yes, it has, it, everything has to do with the image of God. To be sanctified be, means to be holy. But who is holy? So to be holy is to be in the image of God. And this is what the Eastern Orthodox have keyed as theosis. In what we don't use that language, it's not common in the Oriental Orthodox to say the word uh, theopoi or theosis, to be like God. But this is what it is, is to be in the image of God. So the Holy Spirit, he works in you and I to make us in the image of God all the time. And that's why to sanctify means to set apart. To set apart from what? Anything that is not godly. That's what sanctification means. The Protestants speak of sanctification. They don't speak of theosis. But actually the two are one and the same. What are the titles and the names that we find of the Holy Spirit in Scripture? St. Gregory in his oration, uh, oration 31, or number 31, paragraph 2, he says, love, life, light, creator, eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. All these were used for the Holy Spirit in scriptures. What then? Is the Spirit God? This is St. Gregory saying, most certainly. Well then, is he consubstantial? Is he, is he one in essence? Consubstantial? Yes, if he is God. So he's the, f the first one to clearly state it and say it clearly, but he it doesn't mean that, uh, sorry, he takes, he takes from um, all his predecessors, but he declares it open. 
There are an analogies used to understand or to come to comprehend something about the Holy Spirit. And St. Gregory uses the eye, the fountain, and the river. He says, the river has an eye, a source. And then there is the fountain. And then there is the river. But the three, even though we speak of them distinctively, yet they are one body, one in essence, one in nature. St. Cyril of Alexandria he says, since the nature of God is one, the spirit too is unique and is poured forth from the Father as from a spring, like the water that comes from a spring. These are metaphors. We use metaphors all the time. You know, when we say, be careful lest Satan seeds bad thoughts in your, mouth, in your mind. What metaphor is this? What metaphor is, it, what, what metaphor did I just use? Be careful lest Satan seeds bad thoughts in your minds. What metaphor? Huh? No, but what metaphor, what imagery am I using? Farmer. Yeah, that's what a metaphor is. Is it exactly? No, it's a metaphor. The analogy of the sun was used actually is not a recent analogy. The analogy of the sun was actually used by St. Gregory in his Oration 32. The sun, the ray, the light. Limitations. There are limitations to any metaphor. So if someone says, oh, so does this mean that God is round like the sun? Of course not. Does this mean that one day his light is going to go out because the sun is known to, uh, you know, be depleted. No, this is not the purpose of the metaphor. Remember, I told you this when we spoke about redemption and the question of the ransom. The ransom is a metaphor. He paid a ransom. Uh, who did he pay to? No, no, no. Now you're taking the metaphor to another level that is not meant uh, by the metaphor. The metaphor wants to say this is a big value. This is a huge value that was paid in order to bring us back to him. Since Cyril uses another metaphor or analogy called the fragrance of perfume. And I love this. I'm just going to read it because it's, it's just so beautiful. He says, for the spirit is, as it were, the fragrance of God's substance, living and perceptible, providing creation with things that come from God. And a fragrance of a perfume stamps its own peculiar force on the senses and a certain way transforms into itself the receptors it enters, how could the Holy Spirit, since he naturally is from God, not be able to make those in whom he dwells into partakers of the divine nature by his own activity? I'll say it very simply. He says, when I um, uh, spray perfume, and I'm here, and Mo is all the way at the back, even though I sprayed it over here, because it's with me, the Father, the Holy Spirit. But just by spraying it here, it's going to get to Mo at the back, and it's going to interact with his receptors, sense, the, the sense of smell receptor, and it's going to change something in Mo, just the perfume. How much more will then the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, who is from the Father... So why I have, let's say... Um, um, I use Dracar Noir, for example. I don't use Dracar Noir, but I, 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 let's say Dracar Noir or Polo. And I spray it here. And then Mo over there says, Abuna, did you just spray Polo? How did he recognize it to be Polo by just it being sprayed here? It's because the fragrance moves and has the ability to interact with preceptors that work with memory that brings to Mo the knowledge that this is Polo. It's oh, nice. So he said the same thing. The Holy Spirit, who is one with the Father, if he comes into you, into your receptors, he can actually get you to be a partaker of the Father. It's as if the, uh, Mo 
came all the way and entered into the bottle of polo that I have here, or the bottle of polo has brought itself to Mo. He says the Holy Spirit does the same thing. Because he's one in essence with the Father, like the fragrance, he can come to you and interact with you in such a way that you have unity with the Father. You have a connection with the Father. You become a partaker of the divine nature. Conclusions. Analogies can be helpful, but they are limited. Better to avoid analogies. I'm not the one saying this, by the way. This is St. Gregory himself. And... All titles apply to the Holy Spirit except, so he says, all the titles of God can apply to the Holy Spirit except he is unbegotten and begotten. Who is unbegotten? The Father. Who is begotten? The Son. Who proceeds? Holy Spirit. Those are the only three distinctions in language when we speak about the Trinity. But you can say the Holy Spirit is creator, the Father is creator, the Son is creator. The Holy Spirit, the Son, the, the Father, uh, they, they can heal. They can uh, uh, bring someone from the dead and so on. All the operations or all these verbs can be utilized. Shankeda Kanfi Wahed on YouTube was very upset that Abuna Dawood Lamai was saying that Jesus, we can call him Father. And say Baba Yasua. Can Zalan Awi Amal YouTube's on the net and he asked me, What do you think about this? I don't answer. But actually I had an answer for him. He said we can utilize you can say you can say the Holy Spirit is my father. But you cannot say the Holy Spirit was begotten. Because we need to make the distinction with the logos in that, in the incarnation. And not say that the son proceeds from the no, no, he, he is begotten of the father. Now we cannot say that one in the incarnate, the Logos is the one who took flesh to himself. And finally, the filioque, the procession of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. This is from the Creed, who proceeds from the Father. And then the Roman Catholic Church added the filioque which is, and from the Son. Now, it's not biblical, and it, it creates an issue. It creates two sons instead of one son. St. Gregory of Nazianzus asserts divinity of the Holy Spirit because he proceeds from the Father. And I, I don't want to go into the details, but all the fathers never, ever said that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So schism of the early church. This is... Um, a quick overview slide. First Council of Nicaea, 325. Do you see that on the screen? The first one on this side. Then the second council, second attempt for the devil to split the church in Council of Constantinople, 381. The church remained one. The third council of Ephesus, 431. Then Chalcedon. This is the Chalcedonian schism that separated the Eastern Orthodox from the Oriental Orthodox, or what known it was known as uh, uh, Chalcedonian and we are non-Chalcedonian because we don't approve of the Council of Chalcedon uh, and then 880 there's the Photian schism stuff we don't hear about because we were like out in 451 and then in 1054 the great schism of East and West because of the division in politics in the in the Empire East Empire West Empire two emperors and 1517, the Protestant schism, which is the Reformation. The Coptic Orthodox Church has kept such an authentic faith. And we don't say that out of bigotry or out of fanaticism. We say it out of historical truth. We have kept the faith untouched. And so I tell people who are interested in the faith, you are not doing... You're, some people, when they come to the Orthodox Church because of marriage and so on, they feel like they're betraying their, uh, their family or they're betraying their own uh, uh, culture or their own faith. I say, no, no, no. It's like Achilla and Priscilla, who in the book of Acts, they met with Apollo. And Apollo was so, such an amazing speaker, but he was missing a very important teaching, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what did Achilla and Priscilla do? They invited him to, his ha to their house. They had such a nice time together and they were very happy with him, but they taught, and t and they taught him and explained to him the faith in its fullest form. 
as the Bible says. So we have that faith, um, and it, it is a great gift that we have. So, God willing, the next time we can uh, maybe finish up a few things on the Holy Spirit, and then uh, come to the conclusions of the fourth century. And this is kind of like everything now we believe about God and how it was put together clearly in the church from the early centuries and kept in the church. And we have the responsibility to pass it as is to our next generations and make sure they pass it as is. Faith is not or dogma is not mine to play with. It is something that has been kept in the church. As I said to you before, the, uh, you know, Christ instituted it and delivered it to the disciples. The disciples delivered it to the church fathers and the church fathers have kept it in the church. This is our role, to keep that which we receive and not change anything, anything in it. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Ilya, do you have any announcements that you'd like to make? We have a servant from Mexico.